All right. Hello, everyone. I'll give a few seconds for folks to filter in, but thank you all for joining us today. All right, I'll get started now. Hi, everyone. My name is Kania Hale, and on behalf of Logics Magazine, um, the first Black, queer, and Asian critical tech magazine, I'm super excited to welcome you to now the third installment of our Logic Speaker Series. This 10-part series of virtual public events will reflect relevant transnational tech conversations from people and communities doing deeply important uh, work, but too often subjected to institutional marginalization. Uh, running every Wednesday from April 3rd to June 5th, this series will center transnational voices and perspectives essential to thinking critically about technology. We're excited to be featuring organizers, poets, artists, and scholars from Sudan, Palestine, Kashmir, and more, all of whom reflect the varied frequencies of Logic's vision, helping us make critical tech conversations more accessible and develop a shared lexicon for the future we seek to create. I'll send um, links in the chat to learn more about our work, um, but I will pass it over to Khadija to introduce our uh, speaker for today. Hello, my name is Jay Khadija Abdurrahman, and I'm the editor in chief of Logics Magazine. I'm extremely, extremely excited to introduce our next speaker in the series. Um, they're very near and dear to uh, the vision of Logics Relaunch as a Black Asian queer tech magazine, as they are the fashion designer and residence that we've had for the past 18 months um, and have really been thinking through how fashion is a technology and how Black. Black, queer, and trans artistry um, isn't just a mood board for the next generation, but is a, uh, constitutes uh, a series of institutions and practices and rituals um, that are critical to thinking about technology. Bones Jones was born and raised in Virginia, where his fondness for fashion began as a child watching his grandmother sew for her downtown boutique. After receiving his first sewing machine from her at age 16, he studied ballet, jazz, and modern dance at the Virginia School of the Arts. From there, he began. He became a background dancer for various icons, Beyonce, Mariah Carey, Jennifer Lopez, and many others. He made his Broadway debut as an original cast member of The Illusionist and also appeared in Off-Broadway's Fueras Bruta. Retiring from modern dance, Bones moved back to New York in 2019 to focus on launching his line, House of Bones, with an interest in unisex fashion and every and everything lifestyle, HOB has something for everyone. And with that, um, I'm introducing our next speaker, Bones Jones. Okay, I think I'm live now and just here by myself. So, um, Khadija, thank you for that great introduction. I am super excited. And I'm very nervous to be doing this webinar um, and speaker series. This is my first time giving an academic kind of chat or any kind of chat where I'm just here talking by myself and giving a little bit of information about myself and what it is that I do, um, the practices that I take in my artistry, um, no matter what medium it may be in at the moment is currently majority fashion. Um, but like Khadija said, first, again, my name is Bones Jones. I'll write it up here for you if you don't know. Excuse my screechy chalkboard, but we're back at school. That's me. Um, and we are currently in my new studio, which I will show you soon, which is located in the Lower East Side. But first, I just wanted to give you a little background history about myself and where I come from, um, my upbringing, and how I kind of got my training, developed my training into being an artist that I am today. Um, starting out, I am from Virginia, as Khadija said, small town called Surrey County, which is near Richmond, Williamsburg area, if you're familiar. Um, I was born there, and at the age of about nine, I moved to Lynchburg, Virginia, which is just like it sounds, very conservative, a bit small-minded when it comes to 
um, the things and the accessibility that we can have as people, especially as queer Black people um, growing up in that area. Um, majority of my early formal years were not interested really in fashion and and artistry and dance. I always knew that certain things existed, but I wasn't really sure how to obtain them coming from a small background. Um, and then leading into high school, my ninth grade year, I walked into the high school orientation and I go into the cafeteria and there is the drama teacher for the program. And he's just like, hi, um, you're black. And I was like, I am. And he was like, we need about 30 black people to be in our show, which is going to be Ragtime the Musical. I had never heard of Ragtime the Musical. I wasn't sure what it was about, but I quickly found out that it was about a lot of Black people. Um, and so I was needed. Um, about two and a half months later, we started that started the rehearsals for that show. And I absolutely fell in love with the way that everything kind of came into play and just the camaraderie that everyone had to take to make this one moment happen, which is the production. Um, after finishing that production, I really fell in love with the idea of becoming a triple threat and, you know, just having this dream of like really making it to Broadway and, you know, finding my artistry and all that good stuff. So I moved from one area of Lynchburg, Virginia into another area, which would afford me to go to one of the biggest high schools for theater in the country. Um, and that is EC Glass High School. EC Glass High School was also a part of a opera program as well as a performing arts school, which was called the Virginia School of the Arts. Um, before I get to Virginia School of the Arts, I'll jump back one second just to Heritage High School. Um, within Heritage High School, I did a couple shows, but I was also a part of a program which was called the Mayor's Youth Council. And that had a lot of influence on just like how I saw um, myself in the world, how I saw my artistry in the world, and then how I saw those two things as my artistry and what I felt my passion was for myself, kind of combining into one and putting that forth to the world. Um, so while in the Mayor's Youth Council, we would go on these like quick little trips to different states and different cities to meet with other members of the Mayor's Youth, Mayor's Youth Council in that area. Um, and at that time, I was told that I had to make a speech for one of these presentations, kind of like I'm doing now. And in that speech, I made up a word because, you know, my high school friends were like, you should make up a word in your speech and nobody's going to know and everybody's just going to think you're super smart. So I now bring that word to you as in the past, I would say three to four years, that word has kind of resurfaced for me and giving me a lot more insight on, you know, again, what my purpose and passion is behind my artistry. And that word is epintuitus. We spell it E-P-I-N-O-I-T-I. Epintuitus, okay? And an epintuitus is a person who is actively breaking down social barriers and epintuitism, epintuitism is the act of breaking down social barriers. So now moving forward to my time at EC Glass High School, I was one of about three black people in the program at EC Glass. And it was very apparent as the director of the program was a little bit racist and the school was very, very segregated. You could walk into the cafeteria and literally see the left side and right side was split into black and white people. So a lot of times I would find myself um, going to the theater to sit with people that I was more so familiar with and had a deeper rapport with um, so that I felt comfortable um, because a lot of times I was too white for black people and too black for white people. So I found myself in this weird, um, between this weird rock and a hard place where I couldn't really find where I fit 
in the world as a queer person and then again now at school personally um, just amongst my peers. So in the theater is where I really found my um, comfort and my pillow to kind of just like lay on. Um, and in that time, I was, sorry, my notes. In that time, I was able to convince the co-director of the program to let me make my own program um, within the theater program, which was costuming. Um, that costuming program, I was the only person in it, and it was just an hour long of a period where I got to basically just do what I wanted to do. I would sketch, I would, I ended up getting a sewing machine to that space and would fix costumes that was in the costume shop already, organizing, tagging things, just trying to make use of the time and show the director that this is something that you know, could be beneficial for not only myself, but people who would come after me in this program. Um, from Virginia School of the Arts, I, uh, sorry, from Virginia School of the Arts and EC Glass after graduating, um, I was awarded a full scholarship to Liberty University. And for anyone who knows about Liberty University, it is a very, very, very conservative school. And um, just to give an example, the girls, had to wear skirts that were like meeting at the calf and us as guys, we had to wear like button ups or polos to school. Um, so it was a very stringent uh, Christian college um, based kind of under the umbrella of like Jerry Farwell, if anyone knows about Jerry Farwell and um, the church organization that he's under or that he built. Um, from Liberty University, I promised my parents that I would study a year and my focus and my major was going to be in psychology. So I was just doing some very basic courses at the time to kind of, you know, just get my feet wet as a freshman. Um, that year that I promised quickly turned into a semester of just not really wanting to be there. And then after that semester was finished, I, you know, I told my parents that like, this is not what's for me and I have to move, like I have to move from Lynchburg, Virginia and get out. And so luckily, um, a few years prior, my one of the directors of the program at Virginia School of the Arts had taken a few students to New York to just kind of get some experience and get their feet wet and see what it was like in the city um understand what the complexities were we'll get a a mirror or, or a slight image of what the complexities were um with becoming an artist and becoming a working artist in New York City so coming back to New York um I definitely had some a little bit of an idea on what to expect and I had a few people that I had met on the in-between um, so first, I did come to New York for a summer at the Ailey School where I was a fellowship student. Um, that fellowship lasted for about a year and a half. And after my second, my third semester there, they pretty much quickly realized that I was no longer interested in the kind of monotonous and mundane work of concert dance. It was a little bit draining for me at a point. Um, and that was starting to show in my classes and just like how I was physically showing up to class. Um, from leaving Alvin Ailey, I was going now to the Broadway Dance Center, which is located on 45th Street. And I started taking more like tap and um, hip hop classes and a little bit more commercial classes that allowed me to get a fuller perspective on just my dance artistry at that time. Um, going from Alvin Ailey where I had this formal dance training and where I had, you know, the opportunity to learn the technique that I needed for the basis of like ballet and jazz and modern, um, I felt really encouraged but then now going to Broadway Dance Center, it was like a whole new world had opened up just as far as like the things that exist and the type of jobs that could exist for myself. And that was 
exciting and at the same time very very intimidating um just as there were people who had been doing this a lot longer than i had and i felt super fresh and super green with coming into that space i was at broadway dance center for a while and like khadija said I was able to move from there and begin my commercial dance training where I danced for a certain artist like Beyonce, Alicia Keys. Um, my first my first artist was Crystal Waters in Atlantic City. So shout out to Crystal Waters and 100% if you know what I'm talking about. Um, so that was my first like introductions into what this world of being a backup dancer could be and really making a living or more so just learning to live gig to gig off of uh, commercial dance jobs. Um, in New York, I feel that I've, I, I've, so let me pause and go to the very beginning of my talk and just saying that I'm gonna break this down into kind of three different sectors. Um, the first part of this is gonna be about my past. The second part is gonna be my current present space. And the third part is gonna be the future and where I do see myself and fashion and my artistry. So with moving to New York and being in New York, I started to understand that this was a place for me to really grow and develop as a person where I kind of just got my own backbone and was able to start the process of leaving some things that I had learned and just different ways that I, um, wanted to exist as a person in the world. Coming from Virginia, there was a lot of oppressive thoughts and just a lot of oppressive mentalities that I really wanted to shake and, you know, really find the space of adulting for myself. Um, so I would say my, my years in New York were really about um, understanding who I was and getting to the basis of that and kind of canceling out, not canceling out, but just relearning some things, like I said, from my past. Um, as I was growing through that process in New York, I found myself constantly looking for mentors that would help kind of guide my process and help guide me in the direction of what it meant to be a queer male dancer in the scene. Um, even being queer and whatever it may be, um, I was always forced into this box of being the masculine person and having to uh, dance like a man and, you know, be strong and all these things. So that was something that started to put a dampener on just how I saw myself as an artist and how I wanted to show up to jobs and what I wanted to look like and feel like when I was on stage. And a lot of the times I was realizing that the jobs that I was doing was not allowing me to fully grasp um, myself as a person and fully express myself as a person, which, you know, has its pluses and minuses at uh, pros and cons as it is like you're doing these major jobs but at the same time are you really being fulfilled within these jobs and a lot of times I would also find myself being the vocal person within the group um, and so I would see myself in a place where I was at the job the first time and then maybe I did not come back for the second go round because I just had a big mouth. Um, and so I found myself in a lot of uh, spaces of not working for a while. Um, and that's okay because then I realized, you know, fashion is something that I've always wanted to do. And I started to remember that fashion was something that always was a part of me as Khadija mentioned earlier. My grandmother was a seamstress as I was growing up. So she always made me clothes and things for like the first day of school. And um, I just remember sitting and watching her making all these like prom dresses, wedding dresses and like church outfits for different people. And that's where I really started to see the customs becoming a thing. And my, my love for fashion really became like strong. So towards the middle, 
and now in ish of my career of dancing and this is around 2016 or so right before Trump became president um which you know take that how you want but you know, Trump was becoming president and I was kind of seeing that, you know, dance was, it was serving me, but not serving me in the full magnitude that I wanted to be served. And I made the choice to move from New York and make my way to Paris was my first stop, but I knew that I just needed to get out of New York City was like my first objective. What I did from there the world was just to know, right? Um, so I packed my bags. I called my landlord and I was just like, hey, I'm moving out in two weeks. And he was like, no, you're not. Your lease is until blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, just watch me. And so I packed my bags. I packed my dog, a few different pieces of clothing that I had made and a few like paintings that I had done. And I was out. I caught the first flight out. I land in Paris and I get to my flat and I have absolutely no idea what I'm supposed to do now, what trajectory I'm supposed to take. Yes, I have a few items of clothing with me um, and some dance training and that's about it. So I make my way to a few different dance studios and just I'm like, hey, I'm from New York and would like to teach at your studio. Luckily, some people were receptive to that. And that's where I began to find, you know, my footing in Paris. Um, luckily, about a month after that, I moved to a different area where I had a, which was the 10th arrondissement. Um, from there, I found a street. Uh, on my street, there was a store located at the kind of end of my street. I go in and I'm just kind of looking around. From looking around, I ended up meeting the manager and the owner of the store, and we just started talking. He was another Black guy from Africa, and so it made me feel very comfortable, as like a lot of people in Paris do not firstly want to speak English to Americans or people who don't fluently speak French. Um, so that was a difficult task for me, was just like getting around. So once I met him, it really like was a breath of fresh air and gave me some hope for my next however long I was to be in Paris. Um, we start chatting and he lets me know, like he used to live in New York and I'm like, no way, like that's where I'm from, like where'd you live? And so he's getting into like his upbringing in New York and people that he used to work for, come to find out that the person, and the first and only person that he interned for in New York City is someone that I grew up with in Virginia. And I was just like, wow, that's really crazy that you would know this person because like I've even reached out to this person since moving to New York and they pretended like they didn't know me. <laughs> so that's just funny that you being all the way from Africa and then going to New York and then making your way back to Paris, you know, found this person, which was like just really interesting. So what, at, during my time in Paris and in Europe, I really started to understand you know, how I wanted to move now as a designer. I, I saw, you know, all these big brands. I was fortunate enough to um, assist with a few of the shows for Hermes. And that just opened my eyes to a completely different world. Here, I thought I was about to move to Paris and now open a brand and start fashion and just like do the thing. But I quickly saw that there's a hierarchy that comes with fashion in Paris and then learning in fashion in general. So after spending about a year and some change in Paris, I decided that it would be best for me to move back to um, the States, but I knew I wasn't gonna go back to Virginia and I had no real desire and urge to come back to New York at the time. Um, so that just was like, you know, that became very difficult just in the sense of like trying to figure out where I, you know, sorry, I was getting a call. I should have been put on airplane mode. Um, I started to really understand that like I needed to come back to the States and I didn't want, you know, 
to be back in the hustle and bustle of New York City, as well as going back to Virginia. So I made the choice to move to Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, I completely kind of diverted from fashion um, and things kind of took a different turn for me. Um, as anyone who's ever lived in Los Angeles or knows Los Angeles will know that it's very spread out and it's very difficult to get from one place to another within the matter of however long you need to get there. Um, so I was just Lyft driving and Uber driving everywhere. And this was not really what I saw for myself. So after spending about a year and a half in Los Angeles, I finally make my way back to New York where I now start House of Bones. Um, House of Bones originally started as a brand called Boneless Bones, but I realized that within the name, it felt not sturdy. It felt that there was no backbone to it. There was no, no real DNA makeup to kind of build and have standings for the name and for the brand. Um, so I've renamed the brand House of Bones with also understanding that I wanted more things than just fashion within the brand. Um, I wanted, it's a lifestyle brand. And so I wanted to fully encompass what it meant to be a lifestyle brand and what it meant to serve the person who is our customer and our client, whoever that may be. Um, as Khadijah also said, this is a brand that I see I would like to have something and we will have something for everyone. Um, because if you're not going to buy, you know, a bikini or you're not going to buy a gown, you may want to buy cookware or you may want to buy furniture, which are some things that I'll get into in a second. I'll show you a piece or two that I have in mind. Um, so those are some things that I had in mind for my brand and how I wanted to move forward. So now, um, you know, seeing that and understanding you know, how I wanted to move forward with the brand. I started to think back on different things that inspired me growing up, which were some of my early beginnings of seeing fashion outside of my grandmother um, was Project Runway. Season one, Kara San was like the first black, well, it's the first season, but she was the first black person to make it to the finale and unfortunately didn't win. So I watched a couple seasons again, and then I see Christian Siriano, who I was really inspired by, and then I hear him talking about Alexander McQueen, and I'm like, who is this? And then I start Googling that and find that there's a whole world of artists that kind of exist on this medium of fashion that is fashion forward, but also meant to provoke a thought. And that's where I really started to get my footing. And I want fashion to be more than just clothes that we wear. I want it to be sometimes maybe armor for protecting us from outside. I want it to be a political statement. I want it to be something that someone's going to see and feel inspired, not just because it looks nice, but because it makes a person feel good. And so that became the real standings of why I wanted House of Bones to be what it is now. So... Um, in 2020, someone messaged me and was like, hey, Project Runway is now doing casting again for season 19. And I was just like, I don't think that's for me. It's not really where I want to go. Like TV is not my space. Um, lo and behold, I ended up making a tape the night before it was due. And the next morning I had a call saying that they wanted me on the next season, which was incredible and shocking all at the same time. Um, so after about a year and some change, because during this time, COVID was kind of ramping up, going down, ramping up, going down again. So we weren't really sure when we were going to start. And we finally shoot the season. I come off the season and realize that, again, I'm left in this space of not really knowing where to go and what to do with fashion, because there was nothing that kind of to push me outside of, we've just done a show. Um, around this time is when I was approached by Khadija to be a part of the first issue of Logics Magazine, which I have here. The cover is here. And we are also on the back cover. And Khadija approached me and was like, we want 
fashion in a tech magazine. And I'm like, okay, I've never heard of that, but I'm down to do it. And she was like, well, we're going to give you a centerfold. So make sure everything you want to do is amazing. So through the blessings of Khadijah, I was able to make some pieces that um, rang to my spirit and just felt like where I am now in my artistry. Um, and I was able to speak on some things that have been on my heart as i.e., you know, we as Black people and as queer people, I feel we're always on the mood board for everything fashion and everything culture, but a lot of times we do not get the credit for that. Um, and that also segues into a lot of other things that are like underground culture, like for ballroom and um, just different dance styles that are also being taken from. So with my first issue of logics um they saw something and were pleased with what they saw and afforded me a second year um that second year i was very excited which we're currently in um very excited to be doing this and but i was just like listen insight team if we're going to do this um i would please ask that i'm able to have a space to work from because I'm moving in with my new partner now and like I just can't have my work at home. So Insight and the team, now we go on the, on the Cribs part, they have awarded me my first studio here in New York City. And this studio has been such a blessing to me because it's given me the space to roam. It's given me the freedom to be um, in an area in the Lower East Side now where um, a lot of things aren't fashion, but a lot of things are happening. And as you can see, uh, this room was just a bare room at first. Um, I have some photos here of just kind of how we started out. The room was a very barren room. It's about 600 square feet of just emptiness at the moment. And there was a lot of dust, a lot of trash, and nothing that was really, really inspiring to me except these amazing windows. So with the blessing of Clemente and the blessing of the Insight program, um, I was able to convince them that I can build a second floor that I've never attempted to build before. But as you see, like we were pretty successful in doing that. Um, we were given a budget and I was just like, hey, I'm very good at, you know, making $5 into five, look like 5 million as that's the kind of struggle of an artist that we know. Um, you're kind of given a budget that's very minuscule and kind of just expected to do this mag magnificent, you know, project sometimes. And so that's what I did. I, my partner and I, you know, we sanded the walls, we buffed the walls, took the chippings off, replastered, repainted, and a team of people and myself, we bought up all this wood that you see, um, everything under here, has been built from scratch. So this is the workstation um, where the magic happens. Um, kind of messy over in that corner, so don't look too hard right now. Um, but this has been literally the dream. Um, going from the downstairs, we make our way up to the loft, where in the loft, you get just this beautiful space to kind of chill and relax and be away from the workspace. Um, so this has been really amazing just as it gives some, some depth and dimension to the room. Um, making my way back down. After completing this room and getting it to a space where it can thrive. Uh, we quickly found out that we may not have it for as long as 
we would like to have the room. Um, so that's been a bit of a directional change and a mental shift just as far as like the types of work that I want to now take um, and a push in my artistry and where I am currently with fashion and with showing myself as an artist. Um, a lot of the things now that I am fortunate to do do involve pieces like this, which sorry, which I have built for myself. Um, a lot of times I was realizing that I make a lot of beautiful things for other people, but I very rarely get the opportunity to make things for myself. Um, so I made this piece for myself to perform in as, dra as a drag artist. My name in drag is also just Bones, so nothing too confusing. But doing things like this for myself, um, as well as other people, is also now just a part of the... the the process for me that I feel is feeding my childhood kind of dreams and and seeing a space for myself that I wasn't really seeing being fully represented as a child. Um, I saw a lot of things like Miss J. Alexander and um, you know RuPaul and all these different people, but had no real direction on how to get there and so doing these things now really like fulfill my childhood space and really give me the 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 reassurance now that what I was kind of experiencing and the things that I wanted to see as a child were not in vain and like the things that I was dreaming and imagining were not just a dream and imagination they could be real and they could be tangible um, so I find myself a lot of times now in a space where I am just trying to provoke that childhood excitement. Um, and with that, you know, there's a lot of moments that are very crisp and clear and clean, but there's also a lot of things that are still, you know, you're still figuring things out and you're still understanding who you are and how things are made up and everything isn't always so cookie cutter and pristine. So now moving to the second issue of Logics Magazine, I was fortunate to be on the cup. Well, I'm not on the cover, but my imagery is on the cover again. Um, and one of, I know if anyone knows Michael, Falco, he's going to be very happy about this, but Michael makes a very great point at something very often that I do love to reference to, which is Michael says it's kind of his claim to fame, but that's Michael's arm for anyone who knows Michael's arm. And this photo is very important to me because within this, you can see the beauty of what the photo is supposed to be depicting, you can see that there is a clear image, there's a sharp image. We are presenting clothes, we are presenting fashion, but what we're also presenting is that it takes a team to make things like this come alive. And it takes a lot of effort sometimes to make things like this come alive. And as the artist that I have grown, grown up from, um, working on a $5 budget, these are a lot of the spaces that I would find myself in where you know, you're doing a lot of these things on your own or with friends and really just trying to make it happen and make them make the magic kind of appear. Um, so that's kind of where I'm currently existing in my space of fashion and where I see things moving into the future. Um, there are Moving into the future, there are like a few things that I would like to see again for the brand, which are going to home and interior and just like health and wellness. Um, but 
I would love to see where fashion and how fashion will now support us as queer Black artists. Um, a lot of times we are just taken from, and again, being the mood board of these things, but it's now time to switch the narrative to where something can be luxury, not because it's just so expensive, but again, because of how it makes you feel. And a lot of the times that is where I start from um, when I'm looking to make something new, like what am I gonna do in this? How is someone gonna move in this? Where are they gonna go? Um, what kind of image do they want in their mind or what, what image do they see in their mind? And is the wind blowing that day? Like, do we, you know, do we need to go for lighter fabrics? Is it outside where it can move in the wind? Is it inside where, you know, like all these things kind of come into play when I think about fashion. So just moving forward um, in my brand and in my artistry, I would just like to continue to see a space where I feel the representation is fully depicted by um people who actually live that experience. And it takes a lot. It takes a lot to be in a space that has majority been ruled by, you know, white systems um, and, uh, and spaces that are ruled by um, white males. Um, they kind of hold the ticket sometimes when it comes to fashion and the, the keys of the gates for fashion. And um, I am very ready and pushing as hard as I can for this narrative to change and be the representation that I've wanted as a child. So with that being said, I feel like I've spoken quite a bit and I would like to now invite Khadija back. Hi, Khadija. Um, Hi, Hi, Bones. Okay, there you go. <laughs> there's actually, um, there's two questions in the chat um, or from the from the audience. Uh, an anonymous attendee asked, how do you learn or grow in your technical practice and artistry? How do I learn or grow in my technical practice of artistry? I would say that a lot of the things that I end up making um, I don't know why I do this to myself, but a lot of the things that I make are the first time that I'm making something or the first time that I'm doing something. So a lot of the things that you see, i.e. this dress, for example, like I've never done something like this shape before. I don't know if, if you can see there, but like this shape is pretty difficult. So figuring out how to put it on the machine and what the drape should look like is was the learning curve. And so a lot of the times when I'm growing in my practice, it really is like the learning curve in the instant moment and and figuring out just how to make something happen. Another example of that is, <clears throat> I am not, I wouldn't call myself uh, a bag maker yet, or that I am someone who's an expert at bags, but this is one of the first attempts at making my own clutch. Um, and in the inside of this interior is just like cardboard and like wire to make it stiff. So it's just like a lot of trial and error. I will go through a lot of trial and error and just figuring out something before kind of arriving to my next idea of like how I can now expand this idea. Thank you. We have um, a comment slash question from Rosina. They say the dress is eaten. How would you describe <laughs> your aesthetics and how does queering gender inform what you make at HOB? Um, say that last part one more time. Um, how does queering gender inform what you make um, at HOB, House of Bones? Um, so I just like in the title, it was very funny, like, you know, Khadija and I were going back and forth a little bit with the title because I was telling her that, you know, if someone's reading Bones Jones, Bones Jones means queer black in fashion. <laughs> and so I felt like it was like an automatic ATM machine kind of moment, but she quickly let, let me know, like, you know, this is kind of what we need to do to let people know what they're going to be listening to. Um, and so I will say with that, 
you know, I am queer fashion. Like I am queer and I like fashion, whether someone else sees it as that or not. That's kind of where I lead from. We can't, I never really like to, um, I never really like to compare myself or compare what I'm doing into other instances or what other people are doing. Um, so a lot of the inform that I get for my fashion really just comes from the things that I enjoy and the things that I like, i.e. like you see this piece, you know, this was inspired by Beyonce's Renaissance, you know, tour when she's coming out of that floor for the beginning of the concert and she's singing these ballads, like that's what I wanted to feel when I'm doing my drag. So like I have this roughly bottom down here and on the arms, there's like these feathers to just kind of give you a little bit more of like this whimsical feather feel. And that's the feeling that I wanted. So that, that information informed again, how I wanted to design this piece and what I wanted to make. If that answers the question. Yeah, I would just, if you could add a little bit more, I think on the trans part of the title, I mean, I'm thinking about um, just in terms of functionality, we had talked about the possibility of bathing suits that were focused on tucking. You know, we definitely have had models that aren't cis, but also have wanted to not just announce it and tokenize them or like force people um, to out themselves in order to participate. But I do think, you know, it is something that you even talked about explicitly in issue 19 that you know, Kim Kardashian at all, they want to specifically be like the black trans girlies, not just black queer. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a little bit on that aspect of gender and in your, in your work. Okay, I would say, I mean, first, I, I don't identify as trans, but I do have a lot of friends who are of the trans experience. And um, for everyone, for people who are trans, it, there can be, there's a huge spectrum of how people may feel or what they want to present like. And so for me is I'm always making sure again that I have something for everyone. So when I'm looking into making speed uh, speedos or bathing suits or swimwear, I am thinking about how can this, how can this um, undergarment or how can this bikini bottom be for a trans woman and protect her from not being outed just by wanting to go to the beach. Um, so I think about like reinforcing fabrics and thicker fabrics that can, you know, hold us up and um, not give and give the support that's needed for 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 that if they are not post-op. Um, and that is the reality for most that people do choose not to have um, post-op surgeries because that's just not what what resonates in their heart. Um, and so a lot of things that I do does focus on like, how can I protect the identity of a trans person? How can I make it possible for someone to still feel as fab and not have to worry about like, if something's going to slip or, you know, like those kind of things. So that is really important to me when it comes to you know, a lot of the underground ballroom work that I do, I, I create a lot of customs for um, for ballroom. And that is sometimes a concern, like building things that are flattering for the figure and not gonna, you know, lend itself to the opportunity of like a mishap. No, thank you for that. Um, there's another question from Svetlana. When are you planning on releasing your new collection? And if you're working on it already, what is it inspired by? Give us a teaser. So the new collection of stuff, there's actually two collections. The first collection is some summer things that I'm actually very excited about. Um, I wish I could give you a teaser for them, but unfortunately the pieces are not in studio yet. What I will say is that they are inspired by the motifs that are on the mural here. Um, so there are a few pieces that have this print and have this kind of like, you know, um, just I, I, it's my way of muraling. So 
a bones motif, I guess. So that's one part. And the second part is we are also doing another collection for the last, my last issue of Logic's magazine, which is really sad. I can't believe it's coming to an end. But the last issue is focusing on like the bodies and medicine and health for queer and black people and trans people. And so what I'm gonna do is depict the body and I'm gonna show the body, but also show it in like a very couture way with a lot of like new tones and like flesh tone colors and stretch fabrics that really like pull and suck up on the body and like make us and make us, you know, make our eye go to the emphasis of the part of the body that we're wanting to emphasize. Um, also in this issue of the magazine, and with this um, thought of the collection, you know, we are wanting to focus on more um, curvier models and give like the full spectrum of who is wearing fashion. And it's not just skinny people wearing fashion, you know, and and that is a big thing that <laughs> also Khadija and I have been talking about a lot. And so I want to make sure that that's shown in a way that's celebrated and shown in a way that, that is also beautiful and couture and very consistent with the other things that we've also been showing throughout the year. Thank you. We're almost at the hour, but one personal question that I had, and I know this is something that I brought up like in previous editions of the magazine, is that I think, you know, within corporate technologies, in particular computing, the emphasis and the priority is on um, efficiency, removing friction, um, often undermining existing labor protections and about how to eliminate the amount of time people are spending on different tasks. And I think, you know, for us, one of the things that the, having this fashion designer in residence has really showcased is the amount of time that and, and what kind of labor is involved in the like analog production of textiles and weaving them together for fashion. Could you talk a little bit about like give people a sense of what kind of time is involved in producing a line or even just even one item within a collection? Yeah, so, you know, and this is where I always end up kind of shooting myself in the foot a little bit, to be honest with you, because I do not really see time in that way. Um, and a lot of the times people do come to me knowing that I can turn a look really fast. Um, so there's some things like this, for example, this was made in about a day and a half, but then the collection that um, is being worked on currently, I don't have a full hand in it, like I'm not physically producing the things and the samples. So I have to create a sample. And then let's say that I'm making this shirt, I would create a sample of this shirt. And then I would take this pattern now to a production company. And we talk through with the production company on what the sizing is, you know, if the graphics on it are going to be embroidered, if they're going to be um, hot pressed on, if they're going to be screen printed, all these different things. And then the sample is then, you know, it's talked about, sent over to the production warehouse, then they have to send it back to the production office. I go to the production office and then approve it for it then to be put in full production. So sometimes that process, that process can take anywhere from, you know, depending on how specific you are with your pieces and the more you go into um, these meetings and understanding what's needed, you can spend anywhere from three weeks getting pieces back to three months. So the time frame can really vary um, also depending on how intricate the pieces are. Uh, for a lot of the things that are coming out in the summer, there's like a new bag coming that has like, I think like 22 different pieces on the bag. So that was just, that was my first time having to do something that big. And so that was just like a really big brain fuck a little bit to try to figure out, you know, at what inch the zipper goes and then what inch this part starts and then the stretchy part for your water bottle and then the zipper for the whole bag. So there was just like a lot of ins and outs. So it can really vary from, 
from three weeks to three months of time. Well, Bones, thank you so much for such a substantive presentation as well as your responses to the questions. I do also want to shout out that Bones, um, I think you made the bag and shorts, so you made it like a couple of items for the Logix membership. Um, yes. And so the membership is another way that everyone can, who's in the audience can support the magazine. In addition to the magazine, we have the designer in residence, we have the speaker series, um, and we have um, other programming that's happening in the community, support for incarcerated writers. Um, we are doing another program with unhoused people in San Diego right now. And so if you want to um, support this work of Logix Magazine, a way that you can contribute is through the membership program, um, which comes with now collector membership cards, uh, things from House of Bones, um, in addition to magazine subscriptions. But that's it. I want to turn it to Kenia for final comments just on overall. Um, and if you could drop the Sudan Solidarity link um, just so we can promote it for this week. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Um, I am grabbing this link right now. Sudan Solidarity. Yeah. Um, alongside platforming all of our amazing speakers, we're also excited to be uh, encouraging um, on the ground support with whatever various communities we're in solidarity with. And today it is the Sudan Solidarity Collective. So check out the link that I just posted in the chat and um, send them a little cash or uh, just support it in whatever ways you can. But thank you again, everyone, for joining us for this week's Logic Speaker Series. Thank you so much, jo uh, Bones. Um, and hopefully we'll see y'all next week. I sent more information about joining for um, our next events in the chat. Uh, but thank you so much, everyone, and have a good one. Thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it.